In this video, I would like to discuss immiscible fluid displacement. It's important to understand the fundamental processes that occur when reservoir fluids are displaced immiscibly by gas or water. And of course, when we refer to, or when we talk about immiscible displacement, we infer that the fluids do not mix and that there's a clear boundary between the two phases. The displacement process is affected by the wettability of the rock and the mobility ratio between the displaced and the displacing fluids. The total efficiency of the displacement process is measured in terms of the effectiveness of the displacing fluid, that's water or gas, in displacing the reservoir fluid and the proportion of the reservoir actually contacted by the displacing fluid. The fractional flow equations are presented, uh, followed by the Bokri Levert equation, and then the Welch method for estimating average saturation in the water displacement process is um, presented. And then I treat two examples to bring home um, the water uh, oil recovery calculations. So let, let me say a bit about displacement efficiency. I added this to the material because of one of the questions in the example. So in addition to concepts of rock wettability, capillary pressure, relative permeability, mobility ratio, the efficiency of fluid displacement is estimated in terms of microscopic displacement efficiency, vertical sweep efficiency, volumetric displacement efficiency, and the total recovery efficiency. So I'll just take um, each um, measure of efficiency one after the other. So fluid or microscopic Microscopic displacement efficiency is defined as the volume of oil displaced from the invaded region divided by the volume of oil initially placed in the invaded region. Uh, microscopic displacement efficiency is affected by rock wettability, capillary pressure, relative permeability, and mobility of the fluids. If the reservoir pressure is maintained at initial conditions, and the saturation within the bedded region is reduced to residual oil saturation. The displacement efficiency, that's the fluid displacement efficiency can be, can be estimated with this expression. And then that's ED is, um, represents the microscopic displacement efficiency, one minus the ratio between the residual oil saturation and the um, initial oil saturation of course you know this this will also be sy minus sor over soi it, it's uh, when you think about this it's better to conceive a a core which is flooded you know and then you look at the efficiency of displacement in yeah, a core plug and that, that will help you appreciate what this is about now, volumetric or microscopic displacement efficiency is the fraction of the reservoir volume swept by the displacing fluid. It's composed of aerial sweep efficiency and vertical sweep efficiency. The aerial sweep efficiency, on the other hand, is the fraction of the reservoir area contacted by the displacing fluid. So if you take a slice of the, of the um, reservoir area, if you see the fraction which has been contacted by the displacement fluid gives you the real efficiency. While the vertical sweep efficiency is when you take a cross section, you know, and then consider that the fraction contacted by the displacement fluid. And as you might expect, the volumetric disp the, the displacement ef efficiency is a product of the aerial and the vertical sweep efficiencies. Total recovery efficiency, on the other hand, is the volume of oil displaced divided by the initial uh, volume of oil in place. So to get the total recovery efficiency, you need to multiply uh, the displacement efficiency, that's the microscopic displacement efficiency 
by the macroscopic um, displacement efficiency. Now, let's talk a little bit about fractional flow. Uh, I believe this has been treated in um, uh, earlier because of your program, but I will just go over it. So the fractional flow equation is used to calculate the flow rate of a fluid as a fraction of total flow rate when only two fluids are flowing in the reservoir. So two-phase flow is assumed. The next condition we have assumed is diffuse flow, which means that the fluid saturations at any point in the linear displacement path are uniformly distributed with respect to thickness. So that means you're not having any, uh, with, with respect to vertical distribution, it's uniform. The sole reason for making this assumption is that it permits the displacement to be described mathematically in one dimension, which provides the simplest possible model for the displacement process. Fractional flow of the fluid in the reservoir is primarily dependent on its relative, relative permeability, but it also could be affected by capillary uh, and gravity forces. So on the assumption of linear flow, the equation 4.6 is the uh, fractional flow equation, which embodies, you see, of course, to get to equation 4.6, 4.1 is total flow, total reservoir uh, liquid flow rate. And then the respective flow rates are written in terms of the Darcy's law, of course, with a uh, gravity term. And then fractional flow of water, of course, starts with the uh, water flow rate to the total flow rate. Fractional flow of oil would be um, the oil flow rate to the total flow rate. And then considering that um, the capillary pressure is defined as the um, difference between the, uh, the pressure of the um, non-wetting phase minus the pressure of the wetting phase. If you follow the calculations through, capillary pressure is brought into the equation. Now, equation 4.6 is the complete form of the fractional flow equation for water flowing linearly in a water oil reservoir. Quick examination of equation 4.6 shows that it has all the factors that affect uh, the flow of water in an oil water. And you see we have, um, we have mobility ratio coming in somewhere here. We have capillary pressure and we have gravity which are the major forces. And of course, we have uh, the viscosities here, which account for viscous forces. The fact that these factors include fluid properties, rough properties, total flow rate, and even the angle of inclination, as you would see coming in to the gravity term. If it's assumed that the fluid properties and the flow rate are constant, then fractional flow of water is only a function of saturation. In uh, figure 4.1, uh, okay, figure 4.1 is the fractional flow curve, which um, earlier on you have had cause to um, graph. Now you could simplify the fractional flow equation by assuming that gravity and capillary effects are negligible, and that will bring you to equation 4.8. Now, in terms of relative permeabilities, of course, it brings you to equation 4.9. Before I leave this view graph, I need to state that the uh, typical fractional flow curve, you know, which we find in most textbooks and we typically refer to in lectures, is for the flow of water with an unknown favorable mobility ratio. That's for M is greater than one. For M is less than one, you would actually have a concave plot and then um, 
So this is actually for uh, an unfavorable mobility ratio. So for horizontal flow, um, diffusion, um, the fractional flow uh, um, of water is represented as um, 4.9. Now, note that this is based on reservoir property. So it's a um, reservoir fraction, uh, fractional flow. If you want to write the same equation in terms of um, uh, producing water caught at the surface, you need to introduce the formation volume factors. And you see here now that this is reservoir flow rate divided by the formation volume factors. And then, of course, in this equation, rates are expressed in reservoir barrels. If you combine the above equation with um, equation 4.9, you would actually have um, equation 4.9C, you know. So this just comes up typically if um, you are required to um, express the fractional flow of water in terms of uh, producing water cuts at the surface. The, a similar uh, equation can be written, that's 4.6 now, can be written for fractional flow of gas, you know, um, that is immiscible displacement, you know. So the, and equations 4.11, 4.12, 4.13 4 follow the same um, um, derivation for the fractional flow of water. And of course, in this case, gas is the displacing fluid while oil is the displaced fluid. Now, in this view graph, I have water flood um, saturation distribution, and I decided to include this view graph for you to be able to conceptualize um, immiscible displacement better. So to the left, is your water injector and to the right is your producer. So we're assuming that displacement is from left to right. And you would see, of course, all through you have connect water saturation, you know, because that is the minimum uh, saturation or that's, that's the, the irreducible water saturation in the, in, in the reservoir. So you see as the injection process starts, you would have a water bank. So this is water being displaced towards the oil reservoir, uh, towards the oil producer rather. Now you have oil. This profile is due to the fact that M is greater than one. So you are not having a plug flow, plug flow profile. And then here, of course, this is trapped gas, initial free gas, if there is a, any. You know, so this puts together uh, or this captures um, water displacing, um, visible displacement in a reservoir which has some initial free gas. So if you take a look at the um, equation 4x2, it now takes it in different stages. So if you look at it, this is initial conditions, no displacement, you have water and oil. You know, of course, it's not a scenario of the water typically of a line. Now, always remember that the interstitial water is bound to the pores, to the to the pore grains. You know, so now as you begin to, so this is a case where the the water flood has gotten to the midpoint of the reservoir, but note it hasn't gotten to the producer yet. You know, so this is still oil but you have an advancing waterfront. See here, you see that there's a massive jump in the water saturation towards the right, on the right. Here you see water has broken through at the producing well. And here, even after breakthrough, of course, water flooding um, continued, but now you have, you flooded, of course, um, the reservoir such that you are left to just residual oil, you know, and then um, very little oil left to displace. 
Now, so what's the significance of the fractional flow equation and the bulky leverage equation? So the fractional flow equation is used to calculate the fraction of total flow, which is water at any point in the reservoir, assuming the water saturation at that point is known. So the fractional flow is a function of saturation. Now, but precisely how to determine when a given water saturation plane reaches a particular point in the linear system requires the application of a displacement theory. So the fractional flow equation doesn't tell you anything about the position of the water saturation plane. It only gives, uh, helps you calculate the fraction of water at any point, knowing the, assuming that the water saturation at that point is known. So in 1942, Bokri and Leverett presented what is recognized as the basic equation for describing immiscible displacement in one dimension. So for water displacing oil, the equation, that's their equation, determines the velocity of a plane of constant water saturation traveling through a linear system. So of course, right to talk about velocity of the plane, it also indicates that it can give an, an indication to the position of a plane of constant water saturation. So the Bokri and Leverett equation is based on the principle of conservation of, uh, of mass for linear flow, whether it's oil, water or gas, even though of course water is easier through a reservoir at a constant total flow rate. To, um, so in deriving the equation, a volume element is considered of thickness um, delta x located at some distance x from the inlet of the, of the linear model as shown in equation 4.2. So if you take a volumetric balance um, in terms of the water phase, of course, assuming that the density of water is constant, the equation 4.14 can be written because the flow of water into the element minus the flow of uh, water out of the element is equal to the water accumulated in the element uh, at a given time uh, for a constant saturation plane. So you would, so algebraically equation 414 can be expressed as it is in 415, taking note that QT is the uh, rate in which about barrels, delta T is time, uh, is the time interval in days, A is area in feet, and you follow this. Equation 4.15 can be, gives this equation. So if you take limits, equation 415 comes to so you see that there's a direct relationship between the fractional flow of water and the saturation. It says that the fractional flow of water is a function of water saturation only, provided the fluid properties and the total flow rate are constant. So take note of this. And of course, this is assuming that you are injecting in, in, in such a manner that the pressure of the reservoir is maintained. So there's no fluctuation or change in the fluid properties and that of course, you have you are, you are um, injecting at a constant rate such that you do not even increase the pressure of the system such that the uh, fluid properties also change. So if, if the chain rule is applied, um, the partial derivative of the fractional flow with distance can be expressed as it is in equation 418. And then um, by time we substitute, okay, so I just wrote equation 417 here, just for, so that you can follow the derivative, derivation. So when you substitute equation 418 into 417 and rearrange, so the um, change of saturation. So equation 419 gives the water saturation as a function of time at any given location. To a more useful form would require um, would require expressing 
desaturation as a total derivative as um, given in equation 420. And of course, considering that we are, we are looking at a fixed water saturation as it progresses through the reservoir, the total derivative will be taken to be zero and so that this can be equated. And you will see that the uh, derivative of distance with time at a given saturation is given by this ratio. So if you substitute equation 422 into 419, remember 419 is this equation, you would have the x dt, which is the velocity of the constant saturation plane, is a function of the fractional flow of water. So since the total flow rate is assumed to be constant, then the fractional flow of water is independent of time. Hence, this so equation 423 becomes equation 422 and equation 424 rather is the Berkeley levert equation also called the frontal advance equation. So this is the equation of interest. For incompressible displacement, the velocity of a plane of constant saturation traveling through a linear system is given by, so I've just reproduced equation 424 here. This is the equation of the of Berkeley leverage, which implies that for a constant rate of water injection, the velocity of a plane of constant saturation is directly proportional to the derivative of the fractional flow, uh, derivative of the fractional flow evaluated for that saturation. Let me go over that again. That um, Berkeley Levert postulated that for a constant rate of injection, the velocity of a plane of constant water saturation is directly proportional to the derivative of the fractional flow for that saturation. Integrating the equation yields the distance that the constant plane of saturation has progressed within the reservoir, of course. You'd see I put them, um, even though th these ones are in, um, th these ones are in um, metric units, but it's, it's just for comparison. And you see that the factor here, that is QT times T is actually WI, which is the cumulative water injected, you know, assuming that initial condition what I injected was zero at time of zero. So at, therefore at a given time after the start of injection, the position of different water saturation planes can be plotted using equation 425, merely by determining the slope of the fractional flow curve for a different saturation. And you see here, and that's why we mentioned here that the distance or the velocity of the constant saturation plane is a function of the derivative of the fractional flow of um, water at evaluated at the given saturation. A similar equation can be written for gas saturation. So equation 425 can be used to calculate the distribution of water saturation as a function of time in a linear reservoir under either water injection or water aquatic force. The distance traveled by a given saturation at a specified time interval is proportional to the slope of the fractional flow curve at that saturation, assuming the total flow rate and the reservoir properties are constant. So using this approach, the distribution of water saturation in the reservoir as a function of time can be calculated by determining the slope of the fractional flow curve at that saturation. Now, this portion is a little difficult to explain, but I would try to, to um, do that as much as I can. Permit me to come here. So figure four six shows two curves. You have the fractional flow curve 
that's the OGIF curve, which starts here and ends here. And then the, the, uh, um, the bell curve is the derivative. So is the derivative of the, of the fractional flow curve. So you see that what happens is in finding the derivative, it gets to a maximum, and um, it gets to a maximum velocity as it were, you know, because that's maximum value and then trends downwards. I want you to keep this in mind as I explain. So there's a mathematical difficulty encountered in applying the technique, which can be appreciated by considering the typical fractional flow curve in equation four, figure 4.1 in conjunction with the uh, equation, which that's 425. Since there is frequently a point of inflection in the fractional flow equation, note this is the, this is the point of inflection, you know, the point of inflection. In the fractional flow curve, then the plot of uh, the derivative of fractional flow with um, fraction for water uh, with uh, saturation will have a maximum point as shown as I showed in uh, figure 4.6. Using equation 4.5 to plot the saturation distribution at any time would therefore result in a solid line shown in figure 4.3. So if you look at it, this is how, if I you see that this looks like um, the derivative uh, put on its side. So this uh, bulbous saturation profile is physically impossible since it indicates that multiple water saturations can coexist at a given point in the reservoir. What actually occurs is that the intermediate values of the water saturation, which is shown in figure 4.1a, have a maximum velocity, which initially tend to overtake the lower saturations resulting in the formation of a saturation discontinuity or a shock front. Actually, I've shown the shock front much earlier, but so I think I have a better description in one of the... So because of this discontinuity in the mathematical approach of Bokri Leverett, which assumes that the, the water saturation is continuous and differentiable, it would be inappropriate to describe the situation at the front itself. The front is actually, uh, so let me talk about what the front is. So this is the fluid front. And um, when I was talking about, yes. So this is the fluid front. In fact, this is the discontinuity that is being talked about. You see that there's a sharp change, a um, sharp um, saturation profile here. So let me just get back to where I was. So to draw the correct water saturation profile. So what, what it's trying to say is that this is actually not practicable. What actually occurs is something. So let me annotate. This is what the Buckley Leverett equation implies. However, this is what is actually noticed. So this is the front, and this is the sharp discontinuity that is being talked about. So, in order to get the correct, the correct saturation profile and not just the, um, the bulbous profile, what is done is a vertical line, a vertical dashed line is drawn in such a way that the shaded areas A and B here are equal. Then the dashed line there represents the shock front saturation discontinuity that is here. This is 
this is the discontinuity that is being talked about here. That is the saturation. So it's going to be like this, like this. Now, one other thing. So if, if you take a look at this, so this is the saturation distribution as based on the frontal advanced equation. However, this profile, that is this, this is what actually obtains. So this is the shock front discontinuity. So to obtain the shock front pro profile, a vertical line is drawn here in such a way that these areas are equal. So that would give you something similar to what I showed earlier. But if gravity and capillary effects are brought in, you will not just have the front from coming here as a discontinuity. You will have this curve here due to gravity effects and this due to capillary effects. So the higher values of um, saturation catch up with the lower leading to development of the shock front saturation discontinuity, actually still talking about. So the magnitude of this saturation is dependent on the mobility ratio. I'd like you to take a look at this. So in figure 4.7, I have two A and B. A is for the scenario where you are having unfavorable displacement. That is M is greater than one. And you see, if you compare both pictures, you see that this is a piston-like displacement. However, for the case where M is greater than one, M is greater than one actually refers to unstable displacement. You would see that you are having a profile for which the dashed line here is representing the average um, saturation. So the magnitude of this saturation is dependent on mobility ratio, which is unfavorable, that is in for A, for the displacement shown in this. However, for the favorable ratio, M less than one, piston-like displacement is, of course, you know, until flood out. So you're just going to have this until it gets to the um, produce, producer. Now, due to some of the um, difficulties in applying the Brockville-Levert theory when it comes to our recovery uh, calculations, Welch in 1952 provided engineers with a simple method of applying Brockville-Levert theory, including the short front effect in a simple fashion to calculate all recovery as a function of cumulative water, cumulative water injected. So what aim was to calculate the average water saturation in a core plug as fluid progressed. The reason for doing so was that the difference between the average saturation and the initial saturation must equal to the oil recovered from the plug. So NPD, NPD is dimensionless Cumulative water, uh, cumulative oil production rather, is equal to the difference between the average water saturation and then your initial water saturation. Of course, this pore volume just to show that this is dimensionless. Since saturations are always expressed in pore volumes, that's fraction of the pore volume. So too is oil recovery in the above equation. In fact, the water drive recovery equations. In water we have recovery equations, it's conventional to work in pore volumes, respective of whether it's a core flooding experiment or a real reservoir problem, since the recovery is always related to saturation changes. And now, so, so we're getting into applying the Buckley Lever theory in this time, in, in this um, um, case, through the Welch method. So, in the case of the a reservoir flood, the pore volume recovery can be readily expressed as a real volume 
provided the dimensions of the system are known. Wealth method consists of integrating the saturation distribution over the distance from the ejection point to the front, thus obtaining the average water saturation. The situation is depicted at a fixed time before water breakthrough in the well corresponding to uh, cumulative water injection of WI. WI is cumulative water injection. So at this time, the maximum water saturation has been moved a distance x. Actually, that's what you have here. So here, however, from x1 to x from from x1 to x2, you actually have been due to due to unfavorable displacement that m being greater than one, you are having a profile which is not piston like you know and then so welch achieved the uh, derivation for obtaining the average water saturation at the front so the flood front so the flood front that's s uh, swf is the saturation here at this dis discontinuity so the flood force saturation is located at a position X2 measured from the injection point. Applying a simple material balance results in what you have equation 424, and, and let me go over it to you again, that the difference between the average water saturation and the initial water saturation or the conic water saturation, which of course is equal to MPD is equal to the cumulative water saturation, of course, um, and the ratio between the cumulative uh, water injected, rather, and the reservoir, these are reservoir parameters. This is the distance traveled by the flood front. This is the area of the flood front, and this is um, porosity. So if you look at water saturation at the front, but that's actually at the front can be determined graphically using the wealth method by drawing a straight line from the water saturation tangent to the water fractional flow curve as shown in figure 4.8. If the initial water saturation is greater than the irreducible water saturation, then the tangent is drawn from the initial water saturation. So let me show that. So note, this is to on the ordinate, you have the uh, fractional flow of water, and here you have water saturation. So if you draw a tangent from your conic water saturation to all the way to a uh, fractional flow of water is equal to one, where the tangent point equates the shock front saturation, shock point saturation, and also fractional, uh, uh, fractional flow of water at the shock front. Remember that the shock front is where you have the sharp discontinuity. That tells you how far your water flood has progressed or the, the, the position of the water flood at a given time. Now, what is shown in figure 4.9 is a scenario where probably you've had some, uh, there's been some prior production and then you've had them, um, you've had so that the, at the start of your flood, your, the initial water saturation is higher than your irreducible water saturation Then you need to draw the tangent from that point. Uh, from you need to draw the, the uh, yeah, from that point all the way to this. Now, what you have in figure 14 brings in something else. So extending this um, tangent all the way to fractional flow is equal to one gives you the average saturation. Let, so let's go over it again. At the tangent, we have the shock front saturation, but at F W is equal to one, we have the average 
we have the average water saturation. So for average, I've explained average saturation uh, behind the flood front. So once you extend the fractional flow curve to um, the fractional flow of water is equal to one, it gives you the average um, water saturation behind the flood front. At water breakthrough, of course, the average saturation there will be equal to the average saturation at, at a breakthrough where the BT refers to breakthrough. Now for average, for the water saturation after breakthrough, you know, equation um, figure. So let me go over, go over this. Remember that this is the fractional flow curve. If you take a draw a line of tangent from the initial water saturation all the way to fractional flow of water is equal to one, the point tangent point will give you the shock front saturation while the intersection with the fractional flow of water is equal to one will give you the average saturation behind the front. At breakthrough, this will also be the average saturation at breakthrough. However, after breakthrough, the, this is used, you would need to, so progressively after, so remember that this is the uh, shock front, um, this is the shock front saturation, this is the average saturation at breakthrough, and then subsequently, you will draw a line of tangent. This could be 5% above uh, the shock front um, saturation. You draw a line of tangent all the way here. And this gives you the um, average saturation after breakthrough. So the and of course, S SW2 will be greater than SF, but less than the maximum water saturation. The water saturation SF2 is the saturation at the outlet end of the linear system after water breakthrough, which corresponds to the fractional flow of water denoted by, so for, so this is S, let me write it down. So this is actually S W two and um, F W two. Important is it must be greater than your S W F. So this S W F and um, F. W F So I'm, I'm I'll treat an example to illustrate this so that um, these things are brought home So when it comes to all recovery calculations, before, before breakthrough, then the equation 4.25, I think that's 4.25, yes, can be used to determine the position of place of constant saturation, of course, given that saturation range as the flood moves to the reservoir. At breakthrough, it's used as a different manner. So breakthrough implies that the, uh, a, plane of constant saturation has moved through the entire reservoir. So X becomes L. X becomes L. And remember this equation had uh, the average um, water saturation minus the initial water saturation is equal to this. So this is used to study the effect of increasing water saturation at the producing well. So what happens is 
after breakthrough, you now have increasing water saturation at the well. And then the, this same equation can now be expressed in this format. You remember, thus, if, if this is, um, this is taken here, this is brought here, and this is, this represents the dimensionless cumulative water injected in the reservoir that time. So this is, um, so remember that prior to breakthrough, you will have this your the shock front discontinuity coming down here. You know. But as soon as it gets to breakthrough, of course, so this takes place. And subsequently, after breakthrough, you now start having increasing water saturation at the producing well. So just some extra notes on um, calculations. So before breakthrough, of course, the all calculations are trivial. For incompressible displacement, the oil recovered is simply equal to the volume of water injected. Where no water production occurs. So all injected, that means NPD is equal to WID. All the water, all, um, all produced is as a result of water injected. At breakthrough, the flood pot saturation, SF, um, SWF becomes SWBT, which is the producing well and the water cut progressively increases from zero to uh, the fractional flow of, of water at that time. A phenomenon frequently observed in the field and one which confirms the existence of a shock front. At this time, so you see, the, prior to that time, that shock front hasn't gotten to the, result, to the producing well at all. But as soon as it gets to the producing well, you now start having increasing water saturation there. So at this point, at breakthrough, the cumulative um, oil production is equal to the cumulative water injected. And this is represented by this, which is the inverse of the fractional flow, with the derivative of fractional flow of water to um, water saturation. For convenience, these volumes are, are expressed in um, dimensionless form, uh, dimensionless um, pore volumes. Equation 413 is the breakthrough, water breakthrough time. And it's given by the ratio of the cumulative water injected to the um, water injection rate. So after breakthrough, of course, X becomes L and then um, the saturations, the saturation and the fractional flood the producing will gradually increase as the flood moves through the reservoir as shown in figure 412. During this phase, the calculation of water oil recovery is somewhat more complex. There is a graphical technique and, and alternatively, oh, sorry, my error here, there's a graphical technique and then alternatively, the world's equation can be used directly, which is equivalent to drawing the tangents. So let me cross this out. Um, and alternatively, world equation can be used directly. So after breakthrough, the calculation for recovery is a little more complex. Um, you could use two approaches. There's a graphical technique, 
And then there's the numerical technique where the Weld's equation is used directly. Now, as for the, the graphical um, approach, and I, I think I was already explaining that before, it entails choosing the saturations in increments of, let's say, 5% above the um, shock front saturation at day three. So you would see that now in this case, you're not, you're not drawing the, when you select the saturation, you're not drawing, you can't draw this value, you can't draw the tangent from initial, um, initial water saturation to FW is equal to one, but you, you, draw, you, you just draw a tangent from that point up to fractional flow curve where it's equal to one. And that gives you the average saturation in the reservoir block. So let me just clear my screen and then I will get back to that. So what, what, what I have in this um, slide is, so this is actually descriptive. So this, this is a continuation so forth. Each new value of SWE, the corresponding value of SWE is determined graphically and is still equates to this, you know, we, we had shown this equation before. The reciprocal of the slope of the fractional flow for, for each value of SWE gives the dimensionless cumulative water injected in pore volumes of water injected. So this allows a time scale to be attached to the recovery since WI is QI times T. And if you take a look at this, this figure 4.1, so this is the point shock on um, saturation at, at um, breakthrough. This was obtained by drawing a tangent from SWI to meet the fractional flow curve all the way here. And we said that this is the shock pump um, saturation at breakthrough. This is the average uh, saturation uh, behind the flood front. And yes, the shock front. Now here, you take, if you take a 5% increase in the saturation that gives you here, so you draw a tangent from, the, from that saturation all the way to fractional flow is equal to one. And then from this, you can get the slope of the, um, you can get the derivative of the fractional flow with respect to water saturation. And from here, you see, this is going to be one minus FWE, and this is SWE, this is um, average water saturation minus the saturation at the short front, of course, after breakthrough. And this is exemplified here. So what I have here, what, what is shown um, graphically is actually what you have here. So the average water saturation is um, a saturation after breakthrough plus the product of the water injected times one minus the fractional flow of water. Alternatively, as I mentioned, the Wells equation can be used directly. And I will illustrate this in an example. So this is the, so note, prior to, before breakthrough, it was that the cumulative, cumulative um, oil produced, of course, dimension and in poor volumes, was equal to the average um, water saturation behind the front minus SWC. But after, after breakthrough, you are having... So for direct use of the wealth equation, this, and you will see this also reflecting in the previous um, 
graph. All parameters on, on the right can be read directly from the functional flow of this term, this term, this term, except for the cumulative water influx, which comes from the Buckley-Levy theory. So this would require the calculation of the derivative and this I will, I will, I will illustrate in two examples. An example, I think I'll, I'll illustrate an example. Example one, I think I did, I used the, uh, the word equation directly while in example two, I think I used the graphical method. So I think in the next video, I'll be sharing the example uh, on how to use the Buckley-Levert um, equation or theory in for all all recovery calculations under the C goal field.